Well, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be able to see everybody in person after such a long time of not having in-person meetings. So welcome. <laughs> and I understand that uh, some of you have just come back from touring uh, the new pavilion. Uh, it's a pretty remarkable new hospital, uh, changing the skyline of Philadelphia, changing the way we're delivering care uh, here at Penn, and just one of many changes to the campus that I'm sure you're all uh, seeing and, and uh, remarking on. Uh, I've been here at Penn for 25 years. Uh, it keeps getting better. It keeps getting more and more impressive. My name's John Epstein. I'm the uh, Chief Scientific Officer and Executive Vice, what am I? The Executive Vice Dean in the School of Medicine and uh, also a Senior Vice President in the Health System and have the, the joy of uh, being able to help to oversee the incredible science uh, that goes on here. And uh, today we're gonna discuss uh, one of the hottest areas of science, uh, mRNA biology. You're, you're all aware of it because of the vaccines, um, but uh, you may not be aware of some of the opportunities that uh, have opened up in front of us uh, because of some of the advances that have been made and, and we'll try to give you a flavor of that today and be eager to uh, answer your questions with this outstanding panel of faculty who are here to join us today. Um, I think you're all well aware that the fundamental biology that led to the creation of the mRNA vaccines was performed here by Drew Weissman and Katy Carrico. They've gone on to win many, many awards. In fact, I think they're off receiving some awards right now. Um, amongst the many high-profile awards is uh, the Lasker Award that they won, uh, one of the really highest honors. And there may be one more highest honor left on their uh, hit parade if, if uh, our predictions are come true. And they deserve every one of them. Uh, they spent many, many years uh, working out the details of the biology uh, that allowed those vaccines to go forward. Um, often unrecognized, often unappreciated, as is so often the case in science. And uh, I think uh, Harv Friedman here, who we'll, you'll hear from, is one of the people who knew what, what great scientists they were and was a champion, in fact, recruited uh, Drew here, I believe. So uh, we'll hear a little bit more uh, about that uh, as well. I heard last night, uh, I don't know if this number's true, but as we approach a million people who've died from COVID in this country, uh, the estimate was that another million were probably saved by the mRNA vaccines. So for uh, all of us as physicians who hope to save a life now and again, saving a million is pretty darn good. And I know how proud they must feel and how proud we are uh, of all that they've accomplished. Um, I just want to convey uh, my own uh, interactions with Drew. Um, I, I was lucky enough, I run a research laboratory myself. I'm a cardiologist and a stem cell biologist. And I was lucky enough to receive a philanthropic gift to my laboratory um, from uh, uh, the Cotswold uh, Foundation, uh, Martha and Wistar Morris, who are great friends of Penn and of Philadelphia. Um, and it allowed me to take a risk, something that scientists are always eager to do. You know, Grants always allow us to do the sort of next incremental thing. And uh, this, you know, unexpected gift uh, allowed me to do something different. And uh, um, I knew of the great work here in CAR T-cell biology from, from Carl June and Bruce Levine, who we'll hear from. And uh, I was aware of Drew Weissman and Caddy Carrico's work in mRNA biology because of my position overseeing science. And this was long before COVID hit. And uh, we all got together and decided to see if we could uh, apply mRNA biology and lipid nanoparticles to the creation of CAR T cells uh, in vivo. And uh, not to treat cancer, but to treat diseases of fibrosis. In, in the case we were interested in fibrosis in the heart, which causes heart failure. And I won't go into all the details today, but suffice to say that the collaborative nature of Penn which is its defining characteristic from a research point of view, um, allowed me just to walk into Carl's office, walk into Drew's office, come up with an idea, and their immediate response was, yeah, we can do that, let's try that. 
And uh, this work was recently published and featured on the cover of Science and uh, covered in the New England Journal of Medicine because we were able to make CAR T cells in vivo and treat uh, animal model of cardiac fibrosis successfully. So um, I just wanted to give that little story because I think it highlights the power of philanthropy. And I know many of you are big supporters of, of Penn. Um, and also the power of the spirit of Penn, which really is this collaborative nature of people working together. We've all heard the story of Caddy Carrico and Drew meeting over a Xerox machine and started to talk to each other. Uh, uh, that's how they, they met. Um, that's not a one-off story. Um, uh, it happens every day in the, in the hallways here. So uh, uh, I'll introduce our, our uh, panel. Uh, I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves uh, one at a time, and then we'll, uh, um, I'll pose a few questions to them, and we'll take questions uh, from you. And the more interactive and conversational, the better. All right. So uh, our first uh, um, presenter here is uh, Harvey Friedman, who I've mentioned. Um, and he's going to uh, uh, just give us a brief introduction. He's a professor of medicine and infectious disease expert, uh, and he works on vaccines for uh, uh, herpes and other disorders. And uh, I'll let him make his comments. Okay. Uh, thanks. And it's a, a pleasure to be here. I, so this is year 49 for me since coming to Penn. Um, so I, I'm up there. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Um, okay, so my, my topic today is um, on the first slide. Um, okay, I have one slide, but I, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, our work on a vaccine, an mRNA-based vaccine, to prevent genital herpes. Now, we don't have any vaccines yet for genital herpes or oral herpes. HSV2 is the genital form, HSV1 for the most part, oral form. We do have one for chicken pox. We have one for preventing chicken pox in kids and another one for preventing relapse of chicken pox, shingles, uh, in, in the adult. And so there's hope that a vaccine can work against this family of viruses. The chickenpox virus, varicella zoster virus, has very many similar properties to herpes simplex. It causes acute infection, it, it develops latency, and then it recurs. But so far, no vaccine for uh, genital herpes or any form of herpes simplex. Now, why do, why do I think we may succeed? Well, first I should tell you there's been three major trials of genital herpes vaccines over the last 20 years. They've all failed to reach their primary endpoint. None of them, they, didn't, they weren't totally failures, they just didn't meet their primary endpoint. So what makes me think we can do better? Well, there's two reasons I'm optimistic. Now, will we do better? I don't know. Am I optimistic? I absolutely am. So why is that? Well, the first reason is shown on this slide. Uh, in 1984, that's how long it took us to get to here, 1984, we made an important discovery that one of the viral glycoproteins, glycoprotein C, uh, on the left of the slide, it, it, it's on the viral envelope, it's on the surface of the cell as the virus replicates, that glycoprotein binds and inhibits one of the key complement proteins in our serum. Complement is one of those important innate immune mechanisms that attacks microorganisms. Glycoprotein C interferes with that. Five years later, we made another important discovery of another immune evasion molecule on the virus. And that was with glycoprotein E, GE, also on the virus surface. And I show here a cartoon of an antibody molecule attaching by its antigen recognition end, the FABN, to glycoprotein D as an example. But the, per, the discovery was that the FCN, that's the other end of the antibody molecule, binds to glycoprotein E. The FCN is the business end of the antibody molecule, carries out important clearing functions, effector functions. Uh, and the virus has a way to bind to that antibody, preferentially to one that's bound 
already to the virus. It doesn't waste its time to, by binding irrelevant IgGs. Focuses on the important ones and inhibits the activities. Now, the third uh, part of our glycopro of our vaccine is targeting an entry molecule. And glycoprotein D is involved in entry. <coughs> entry. And as you know, many successful vaccines, such as COVID, is targeting entry. So reason one I'm optimistic is we have a novel strategy. To my knowledge, no one has designed a vaccine specifically to inhibit the virus from evading the immune system. And we're going to block viral entry like many others have. So what's the second reason? Well, oh, well here, I, I, sorry, I, here it just shows what our vaccine is intended to do. We make antibodies that bind to these immune evasion molecules, CNE, and don't let them function. Don't let them do their evasion. And bind to the entry molecule and don't let the virus get in. Good for a prophylactic vaccine. Don't let the virus enter. The second piece is um, what Jonathan uh, referred to, a chance event. Um, Drew Weissman's office is near mine. He had made a presentation to our division. He was talking about his work on mRNA discovery. This was in 2016, three years before COVID. And I went into his office and I said, let's collaborate. I like that platform. We have a good idea. Your platform can make the difference. And he, just like he said to you, John, he said, let's do it. And that's Drew. And that's Penn. You know, that really is the pen, the pen way. So we did it. And we've been working on that now for, I guess, five years. Um, and uh, where are we? Well, how do we do it? We, we have two good animal models, mice and guinea pigs. I won't go into details, but you have to show in preclinical testing that the vaccine is looking great. And it is looking great. Fortunately, we have a corporate sponsor. I, I'm... Uh, our vaccine uh, initiative is listed, but we haven't uh, obtained uh, final FDA clearance yet. And the corporate sponsor has asked me not to make any specific announcements. But I can tell you it's one of the major mRNA companies that's taking us into the clinic. That's going to happen September 1st, if everything goes as we expect. And we will have taken something from the bedside, 1984, to the clinic 2022, and maybe it will work. But I'm hopeful, and uh, we're hoping that this vaccine will, will be a step forward, a major step forward in preventing uh, recurrent, uh, pre preventing genital infection. Okay, so thank you. Harvey, I didn't mention this earlier, but I got an email last night from a patient who was asking what's happening with that vaccine and, you know, when can I get it? When can I enroll in the trial? So you know that there's going to be a lot of interest in this. The uh, ability of, you know, to make mRNA vaccines to many, many different diseases is, is obvious. And we're working as hard as we can to expand that uh, platform. In fact, we've just uh, announced recently the um, beginning of a new RNA institute here at Penn. And you'll hear a little bit more about that today. In fact, there's a lot of people working on RNA at, at Penn and have been for many years, but this is an opportunity to bring them together to really accelerate advances. And when you hear about the time frames that you're talking about, it makes the uh, speed with which the uh, COVID vaccines came to market even that much more remarkable. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Bruce Levine. Bruce is the uh, Barbara and Edward Netter Professor in Cancer Gene Therapy. He's a co-inventor of the patents that led to CAR T cells, longtime collaborator with Carl June. He's also the person who uh, came up with the phrase Silicon Valley to uh, uh, name our local biotech ecosystem here. Uh, as you may know, there's just an exploding number of biotech companies coming to Philadelphia uh, interested in cell and gene therapy, which Bruce aptly named Silicon Valley. So, Bruce. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to keep my mask on if everyone can hear me okay. If there's any difficulty, I'll, I'll speak up or take it off. So I've been um, at Penn as faculty for 23 years, but this is my second tour. I actually first came to campus in 
1978 when I was high school, uh, working summers at the Worcester Institute and went to Penn as an undergrad. And my father was a researcher at Wistar. Uh, when I was thinking of going to graduate school, he said, well, you should work in a lab full time to see if you really like it. So I took a position at Children's Hospital work, working in the Division of Infectious Diseases when Harvey was there in the 1980s. And, and then uh, went to grad school at Hopkins, postdoctoral fellowship with Carl June when he was at the Naval Medical Research Institute. We started a clinical trial there using T cells to augment HIV immunity. And Carl was being recruited all over, NIH, Harvard, this place, that place. And then Leonard and Madeline Abramson donated $100 million to start the Abramson Family Cancer Research Institute. And Carl was being recruited there. And I said to him, well, when he told me about this opportunity, he said, you know, I went to Penn as an undergrad let me tell you why you want to be in Philadelphia and at Penn. So it was kind of like reverse recruiting. Uh, and, and we got him here, and, and uh, many things happened after that. So what I'm going to talk to you about uh, is uh, two things. One is how we can use RNA for chimeric antigen receptor T cells, and a little bit more about Philadelphia ecosystem. These are my disclosures. They're managed in accordance with the University of Pennsylvania Policy and Oversight. So normally, CAR T cells use a retroviral vector or a lentiviral vector to permanently integrate into the genome and express that CAR forever and all the daughter cells. So why would you want to use RNA uh, that's temporary? Well, when we wipe out B cells targeting CD19, those B cells are gone in, in many patients for years or, or forever, and they have some compromised immunity, although that's manageable with supplemental immune globulin. But what about targets that may be brightly expressed on tumor but dimly expressed on other tissues? How do you interrogate that? How do you determine if that's a safe target? When you deliver RNA to a T cell, that's there temporarily. So you could give a CAR T cell that'll disappear off the surface, and then you can look at whether you have some activity and some safety. So here's a, a graph uh, to show you what happens when you deliver RNA by electroporation. You get very bright expression immediately after, and then after a day, two days, three days, seven days, you can see that it disappears. Because the RNA is degrading, uh, although we can stabilize it, but when a T cell becomes activated, it divides, and then you have half as much RNA, and then you have half as much expression. So we've conducted a number of clinical trials, first targeting a tumor antigen called mesothelin, uh, and here is an early clinical trial. Now, this is the best out of six patients that responded, but you can see baseline, and then one month later, there is activity targeting mesothelin. Uh, there was not the uh, adverse uh, toxicity that would lead us to discontinue investigating mesothelin as a target. In fact, we then converted to lentiviral cars uh, to target mesothelium because we had demonstrated the safety with RNA. Now, what about using RNA? Well, here's a study comparing RNA cars to lentiviral cars, and this was done in collaboration with David Barrett at Children's Hospital. And if you adjust the dose and the schedule of giving those RNA car cells, you can get pretty much equivalent uh, potency in a mouse model to a lentiviral car. Now, viruses are expensive to make. They take a long time. You have to test them. So RNA is an alternative pathway, and we've tested that not only in mesothelin and mesothelioma, pancreatic and ovarian cancer. We've used CMET in breast cancer, and we're looking at other tumor antigens where we might want to in interrogate whether that's an appropriate target. Okay, so uh, that's uh, my plug for RNA CAR T cells. 
So now um, uh, let me tell you about uh, why Philadelphia is the birthplace of innovation. And, and the origin of the phrase Silicon Valley is when uh, I'm the founding director of our cell manufacturing facility and patients and their families over the years have wanted to come toward that facility. And I was talking to a patient uh, family. I, I think it was uh, Tom and Carrie Whitehead, actually, Emily's parents. And I tried to describe what we're building. And I'd like to say that I devoted a lot of thought to this, but in, in about half a second, that term Silicon Valley just popped into my head. I don't know why. So that's the origin of the phrase. Look at this neighborhood. If you walk around, you see new buildings uh, that are here now that weren't here uh, when you attended. Uh, you see cranes and construction, uh, and this isn't new. Uh, America's first scientist, right? And we've been known historically as meds and eds in Philadelphia. Now we are the new meds and eds. Now, I told you I was an undergrad at Penn, and I passed under this gate next to Houston Hall many, many, many times without reading the Latin, without understanding the Latin. Uh, does anyone know Latin well enough to translate this? It translates to, we will find a way or we will make one. And that's the culture of what we're doing here. If there's not a way, we will invent it. Uh, there's more building going up uh, in innovation and uh, cell and gene therapy just down the road at the Pennovation Center. If you haven't seen that, this is uh, what used to be the old DuPont paint factory where they developed the paint for the stealth bomber. Now we have robotics there. We have a drone testing facility. We have biology labs. There's IT. Uh, and there will be cell and gene therapy there. And so I, I told you I, w I was using this term Silicon Valley, and about six years ago, Carl June was attending the Bio Convention, which is the Biotechnology Industry Organization, and he was in the cab, and this logo came up on the TV in the cab, and he took a picture and he sent it to me. So. Little did we know that Life Sciences PA, PA Bio, uh, had created an advertising campaign at the Bio. And so here's this official logo, which is the background on my Twitter account now. Uh, by the way, B-L-L-P-H-D, uh, so you can see what I'm up to. Uh, but what, what I have in the middle here are, are some of the companies that were spinning out of the Penn Gene Therapy Program, the Center for Cellular Immunotherapy. So what started a, as a uh, intellectual exercise to follow the science, uh, what did Ben Franklin say, right? What, what is Penn founded on? It's to be useful. To be useful, you have to discover something, you have to innovate, and then translate, replicate, and disseminate. So that's what we're doing. We have companies now that are taking this from the early phase clinical trials to the late phase clinical trials. You've heard about our alliance with Novartis. Uh, Novartis last week uh, announced they have approval in Europe in follicular lymphoma. Uh, they have 340 treatment centers in 35 countries around the world and have treated 6,900 patients with CAR T cells. The whole field is treated between 15,000 and 20,000 patients, and that technology was born here. So thank you. I, I think what's interesting to me is that with these uh, successes and, and other scientists uh, and physicians seeing these inventions and discoveries coming into to be real therapies uh, affecting treatments everywhere, it's changed the culture at Penn. And many of our young scientists, you know, uh, including my, I'm not a young scientist anymore, but it's changed my view too, which is that uh, uh, the work we're doing in the basic science lab might, isn't just something that one day somebody else might make into a medicine or use for a medicine. It's actually something 
I can make into a medicine. I can see it happen in my lifetime. And uh, that's a real change in, in, in culture. And it changes the kinds of work that people do. And, and we realize that you have to do it in collaboration with biotech and pharma. And so attracting these companies or spinning out these companies is not, um, I think, mostly done to make money or some, you know, it's really because uh, it's to make the scientist dreams come true, which is to make a real therapy, make a, a real medicine. Um, if they make a little money, not so bad. Um, uh, the next uh, speaker is Kristen Lynch. Uh, Kristen is the uh, Benjamin Rush Professor of Biochemistry, and she's the chair of the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, and uh, she's a uh, world-renowned RNA biologist. Kristen? Thank you. So, um, as many of you may remember from when you first took intro biology, either in college or in medical school, you would have been taught how the flow of information in cells go and what, what's known as the central dogma, which is essentially that information in our DNA and our genes gets transcribed to RNA or mRNA, which then gets translated to protein. And it's that, that step of translation, which obviously Drew Weissman and Harv and Bruce and others have leveraged to make cells make proteins for therapeutic value. But what I'm excited about and what I'm hoping to excite you about is that that's really just the tip of the iceberg of what we can do as we start to understand this molecule, mRNA. And that's because this process, let's see if I can make a dot. The, the process of translation is not static. That is, it's not just one mRNA goes to one molecule of protein at some rate of, um, of synthesis. But we can toggle this. We can make more protein. We can make less protein. Um, and the cell does this normally to control the amount of protein your cells make under various uh, needs and conditions. In addition, over the past 20 years, we've understood that mRNAs can be pieced together in different ways in a process known as alternative splicing, so that that same gene, that same piece of DNA, can now make multiple different mRNAs, multiple different proteins that have different functions. So you can turn a cell on or off by changing which version of the mRNA is present. So the cell has known this for millennia and takes advantage of this. But now that we as researchers and basic scientists understand more, we can leverage this um, in therapeutic ways. And so when is this useful? So there, there are a number of diseases that we already know about that are due to either mistakes in the efficiency of translation or splicing, or could be corrected by us being able to, as clinicians or as scientists, being able to manipulate that. So some of these would be haploinsufficiency diseases, um, so diseases where there's only one good copy um, of the gene in the person's cells, and that's not making enough protein in order to keep the, the body healthy. Alternatively, there are mutations, disease-causing mutations, that we now realize don't um, necessarily completely change the protein that, that is made um, or make a bad protein, but rather make the wrong isoform, make the on version when it should make the off version or, or the other way around. And so what's tremendously exciting for me at Penn, and a big reason why I'm here, is that we have basic science researchers who are understanding the processes of all of these um, various steps of genetic control. And the more we understand how the cell does this, the more we understand what are the sequence features in an mRNA that allow those choices to be made, more protein, less protein, the on version, the off version, we can now manipulate these. And um, already there are researchers here at Penn that are motivated by the success that Drew Weissman and others have had, are trying to think about how do we leverage that, the technologies that we have 
to manipulate this mRNA that's in the cell to allow viability, to allow health, and uh, to fight disease. So I just want to point out some of my colleagues. Um, obviously, these are more names than you can read. But what I want to emphasize is that these are researchers across all of the basic science departments, many of the clinical departments. They're people who are just really thinking about biochemical mechanism, and they're people who are dealing with patients. And the ability to interact together, as you've heard, um, this is the real strength of Penn, the ability to know who each other are um, through this institute that John mentioned, um, which is forming more and more mechanisms for us to interact, for us to get to know each other, and to think broadly about how can we use what we know in order to treat disease. So I think it's the future is really bright. Um, not only is, is Harv going to give us a, a vaccine to herpes, but um, we're going to be able to create um, therapies to a lot of different diseases. And so I'm excited, excited to be here and to be part of this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kristen. Um, our uh, next speaker, uh, Norbert Pardee, is uh, um, an up-and-coming star in, in uh, vaccine development. Um, you know, Philly and this region has an incredibly long history in vaccine development. Um, a lot of attention now on the COVID vaccine, but you know, the polio vaccines, uh, rabies, rubella, uh, hepatitis, rotavirus, um, all developed, you know, the Wistar, CHOP, or PEN. Um, and so uh, we want to double down and see that uh, uh, expertise and success of vaccine development go well into the future. And Norbert is one of our um, shining examples of that. He's trained with uh, Drew and Caddy, and he'll tell you a little bit about his experience. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm not going to tell you about uh, science in the next couple of minutes, but if uh, time permits uh, in the uh, questions and answer sessions, I'm going to, I would be happy to tell you about my next generation mRNA vaccine work uh, I'm, I'm pursuing in my uh, laboratory. So let me tell you about my experience being trained in, uh, being trained in the KT Curricode's lab and of course Drew Weizen's lab as well. So um, I think you agree with me that uh, plenty of success stories demonstrated being in the right place at the right time uh, can significantly contribute to a later success. One great uh, example is uh, how Drew Weissman and Katie Carico met at the Xerox machine 25 years ago, started to talk about uh, their research interests uh, and um, established a very fruitful collaboration that laid the foundation of the successful Pfizer and uh, Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. My uh, uh, timing was also pretty ideal for me. 11 years ago, when I finished up my PhD and started to talk to Drew and Katie about doing a postdoctoral training in their, uh, uh, in their labs. As you know, life has many twists and turns, and I believe my story with Katie Carico is, is really an unusual one. Our relationship uh, dates back to the early 2000s, when I was an undergraduate student in Hungary. And you probably know that Katie is also from Hungary and moved to the US uh, uh, in the 1980s. And uh, we have um, very strong uh, family uh, connections uh, because uh, as uh, Drew, um, Katie's uh, father and my grandfather, okay, we have a pointer. So this, this is my grandfather and this is Katie's father and they worked together in the same butcher shop uh, in my hometown <laughs> in the 1940s and 50s. So this picture was taken in uh, 1949 and just for fun, uh, Katie and I took a very similar picture uh, 63 years later here at PEM. So uh, she, um, uh, she visited her mom uh, every year, uh, and uh, uh, we met every summer and, and talked about science in my, uh, in my hometown. And during these chats, she, she really urged me to finish up my PhD and, and uh, come to Penn and join uh, Drew and herself and start working on uh, messenger RNA-based therapeutics. You can imagine that I was super excited about that. And finally, in 2011, I moved to the US, and uh, the three of us started to work on uh, uh, developing a messenger RNA-based vaccine uh, against HIV. At that time, the biggest issue was that uh, we could make very high-quality messenger RNA, but we could not deliver RNA uh, into experimental animals. And obviously, without that, it's not possible to develop and test uh, a vaccine. 
So it took us three years to find lipid nanoparticles that are absolutely key components of the uh, currently used COVID-19 um, uh, messenger RNA vaccines. These three years were really tough because we work very hard, many times 10 to 12 hours every day of the week. But um, I really learned uh, uh, more about science, uh, professionalism, leadership than my entire life uh, before. I also need to point out that both Drew and Katie uh, were exceptionally supportive uh, mentors. And that, at that time, uh, they had really small labs, like three, four people in each lab. So many, many times they worked shoulder to shoulder in the lab um, and did experiments uh, uh, together, which is also pretty unusual, I believe. Um, in the first two years of my training, I spent a bit more time with Katie because Drew, as an infectious disease physician, did uh, clinical service as well. Um, so, um, so how was how was life in, in, in Katie's lab? It was tough because uh, we, ha we had to work really hard, but we were uh, determined to succeed. Um, and uh, and Katie set a really inspiring example. Um, even though she was a PI and uh, and a senior scientist at that time, uh, she still performed uh, actual experiments in the laboratory. So her bench was next to mine. Uh, so we could very quickly uh, troubleshoot uh, when it was when it was necessary, uh, and really we we worked uh, shoulder to shoulder. Uh, and let me show you another picture. Uh, so this was taken in 2012. But the interesting part is in the background because you can see multiple layers of empty pipette tip racks, and we kept these uh, empty racks for a while as symbols of hard work in the lab. Uh, because we had to use up thousands of uh, pipettes to be able to generate uh, that many uh, that many empty uh, empty racks. Um, another uh, unusual aspect of Katie's lab was that um, uh, we we could find pretty much one hour every day to talk about very general uh, scientific questions. Uh, many times these were questions from everyday life. I can recall one of these questions because uh, I remember that I did not know the answer uh, to that question. Uh, and so the question was, uh, how many ears of corn grow on one stalk? Uh, it's a very simple question. We all know how uh, corn stalks look like, but I think uh, many of us do not know the answer. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the whole point with these very simple questions was that Katie wanted to convince us that uh, first we need to ask very simple questions in science, fully understand the background, uh, fully understand basic phenomenon, and, and uh, then move to the next step and, and uh, deal with more uh, complex problems. So uh, I'm very lucky because uh, I'm one of the very few pupils of Katie Carico, and, uh, and now we are not only colleagues, but really good friends as well. And both of these are equally important in my opinion. And I really hope that uh, I can follow, uh, follow in the footsteps of both Drew and Katie by working with very smart and motivated young people in my lab and um, fostering their careers by giving them as much support as possible. And I really hope that uh, this will also lead to very important scientific discoveries in the future. Many thanks for listening. Robert, thank you very much. So um, uh, let me just ask one or two questions and then get ready to throw your questions at us. Uh, and we'll be happy to answer as many as time permits. Um, Norbert, I might just start with you. The, uh, um, you know, the fundamental discovery that allowed mRNA to be used therapeutically uh, was that it generates some sort of immune response. And I wonder if you can just explain, you know, that discovery and what was done to, to get around that immune response. So, uh, yeah, you can hear me. Okay, good. So, um, uh, there were three basic uh, problems uh, that, uh, that had to be overcome to be able to use messenger RNA for therapy. Uh, the first problem was that, uh, messenger R that our immune system cannot distinguish a therapeutic RNA uh, from, for example, a viral RNA unless you modify the RNA somehow. And, the, uh, if, uh, and therapeutic RNA and viral RNA also comes from the extracellular space. 
and it induces immune responses. And it induces a very strong immune response, particularly double-stranded RNA. So it was very important to figure out how to overcome the problem of inflammation. And the groundbreaking work of uh, Drew and, and Katie uh, uh, could solve this problem because they figured out that uh, if we replace uh, some of the building blocks of RNA, uh, with some uh, other types, uh, we call the, these building blocks uh, nucleotides, and we can replace some of them uh, and uh, overcome uh, the problem of uh, inflammation. So that was one issue, inflammation. The second problem, as many times in si and, uh, translational science, is delivery. Uh, the problem is that RNA is a large negatively charged macromolecule, uh, and that can, it cannot really go through the uh, cellular membrane. So it was very important to find a delivery molecule that uh, we can use to, that facilitate the uptake of messenger RNA, plus it uh, uh, protects RNA from extracellular degradation. And uh, in 2015, we found these famous lipid nanoparticles, and uh, these have a, a double duty. Um, they can protect the RNA from, uh, uh, actually it's not double, it's triple, because uh, they can protect the RNA from degradation, they facilitate cellular uptake, and it, it turned out that they are also fantastic adjuvants. So they really help to induce uh, an immune response. Terrific, thanks. Uh, Kristen Lynch is an expert in the interactions of the immune system with RNA, and, and uh, um, I've always wondered why the immune system doesn't attack our own RNA. So unlike the RNA that comes in in a virus um, or comes in in an unmodified uh, RNA before Drew and Carrico and, and Norbert discovered how to modify it, in the cell, RNA is coated with proteins. And those really function as, as a barrier um, and as a signal as well to the cell that you know, this is good RNA, keep this. Um, we also have modifications on the, the ends of the RNA, the five prime cap, a three prime poly A tail. Um, and those also serve as markers to the, to the cell to ensure that it's seen as friend and not foe. Um, and so that's the biggest reason. And it's, uh, I guess, a defense against RNA viruses that we have an immune response to, to RNA in the first place. Correct, yeah. yeah. And yeah. with the exception of the vaccine, usually when you take RNA in from the outside, it's a bad thing. Yeah, good. Uh, Harvey, the, um, uh, you know, you told us about the herpes uh, vaccine that you're working so hard to generate. Um, give us a little more sense about why all this hype about RNA, what, what's better about mRNA, not just for this vaccine, but for other uh, vaccine developments that we might want to make? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I mentioned that uh, Drew had given a conference, it was in 2016, in the Infectious Disease Division, and he presented some data he was generating with influenza virus uh, vaccine, and it was very impressive. Um, actually, at that conference, one of my colleagues, uh, Rahul Kohli, said uh, Drew is going to change the world. And that was his comment in 2016. And a, very, a very smart guy, obviously. But uh, th th So when I went to his office and said, let's try it, I didn't think there was a chance in hell that it was going to work. I did not think it was going to work. We were working with protein-based vaccines, adjuvants, and I, I was very pessimistic. But, you know, he had presented the data, let's see what happens. And we compared it to the protein, the, sort of the standard was you know, protein-based. We compared it side by side. We've spent five years comparing them. And the mRNA vaccine wins every time. It, it gives a better immune response, a better antibody response in particular, and it has more durable immunity. And the durability is really important. Now, with COVID, we see some concern, <coughs> concerns about durability, but it's, it's a, it's, it's a, there's another issue with COVID. The virus keeps changing. So as you're running after the target. With herpes, thankfully, it's a very stable virus. So hopefully the durability will be less of an issue. But, uh, you know, John, I, it was prove it in the lab. Um, the titers that are achieved are just remarkable, yeah. Um, Bruce, uh, you, may, you talked about using RNA to make uh, CAR T cells, which sounds different than making a vaccine. Um, can you comment, you know, on the opportunities for RNA therapeutics 
beyond vaccines and maybe about being able to target different types of cells as you deliver the RNA? Yeah, so um, what if you combine CAR T cells with lipid nanoparticles, right? And what Drew and John and Haig Akajanian um, and uh, Ellen Pure, Steve Albelda, Carl June and I are engaged with now is putting RNA in lipid nanoparticles that you know, but then targeting that lipid nanoparticle to T cells. So what I showed you the data, we were using electricity, electroporation, uh, to open up pores in the cell membrane and deliver RNA. I can tell you that cells don't like to be electrocuted. Uh, <laughs> you lose a lot of them, uh, you can generate enough, but it's not very efficient. But lipid nanoparticles, it's like butter, right? They'll take it up, they'll be healthy. So now, what could that RNA encode? It could encode a chimeric antigen receptor, it could encode a cytokine or a biologic response modifier. It could encode an antibody to block the checkpoint to enhance anti-cancer immunity. It could encode any number of things, and making those targeted lipid nanoparticles is a lot simpler and cheaper than making a viral vector, and it's also faster. So that's going to accelerate our research, and it's going to make it less expensive to interrogate strategies to induce anti-cancer immunity, or in the case that was uh, published in January, where there was a chimeric antigen receptor targeted against fibroblast activation protein in fibrosis. So now think about all the different fibrotic diseases. Now think about autoimmunity. You can also target B cells and have an effect on autoimmunity. There was a New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, using CAR T cells and lupus. So the uh, additional application is, what if you use that lipid nanoparticle to deliver CRISPR or gene editing enzyme? Then you can knock out or you can knock in. So now you can see the possibilities are multitudinous when you combine RNA lipid nanoparticles in a way to target that lipid nanoparticle to immune cells. So this is why many of us are like, you know, it's really a whole new therapeutic platform. And uh, one of the tricks is to coat the surface of the lipid nanoparticle with an antibody that sticks to whatever cell type you want. You want to get to a T cell, coat it with an antibody that makes it stick to T cells and deliver the RNA to the T cells. If you want to deliver something to the heart, coat it with an antibody that sticks to heart cells. If you want to fix hematopoietic stem cells in a patient with sickle cell anemia, coat it with an antibody that sticks to hematopoietic stem cells and deliver CRISPR or something to fix a gene, an inherited gene mutation in a hematopoietic stem cell. It's really amazing. And uh, the RNA that you're loading the lipid nanoparticle with, you basically dial in to order. I mean, it's not hard to, it's a chemical synthesis. So it's not like you have to grow, you, you know, vats of protein to make enough to deliver. You, you, you sort of order it up and that's why, you know, it can be generated very, very quickly. So you can try many iterations of RNAs. So we're going to see a lot of innovation around this space in the next decade that uh, I think will cure some diseases that have been incurable until now. All right, we've used up a lot of time, but we have a few minutes left for, for your questions. Is anyone working on a target in that virus that's more stable than the spike protein that keeps mutating? that would allow a longer duration of effect of uh, the vaccine, uh, targeting a part of that virus that is not going to constantly mutate. Barry, you want to take that one? So people try to target uh, several antigens uh, of the virus. Uh, the problem is that uh, spike is a, it's a too 
good target because um, um, you can produce really good antibodies about it. But like you said, that's the problem uh, that uh, um, uh, that uh, it, it changes uh, and uh, and it's it's just not that easy to induce durable responses against all the uh, different variants. So. Um, there are a couple of possibilities that we can do. We can try to target uh, or we can try to induce very good T cell responses uh, and, uh, and try to find targets for that. Uh, but antibodies are really good. So another potential um, strategy would be to develop and both through Weissman's lab and my lab and, and uh, many others work on the development of broadly protective uh, coronavirus vaccine. So it's possible to uh, come up with strategies and design special antigens that would protect against uh, variants um, and, uh, and not only SARS the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but potentially um, future uh, coronaviruses as well. So they're definitely working on that very hard. A pan-coronavirus uh, vaccine that would go even beyond COVID-19 would be absolutely terrific. Other questions? Yes. We, have certain, we certainly hear about the upside of the RNA uh, virus. What kinds of things are you worried about? Are there any ethical concerns? Are there any you know, downsides that we should be aware of? Of working with RNA as a therapeutic? Yes. yes. Anybody want to comment? There are none. No. no. <laughs> uh, to, to my mind, yeah. The, there are none. Um, that going back to the, the central dogma of DNA, RNA, protein, RNA is transient. And, and as you've heard from some of the other people, that has real advantages, that you're not making permanent changes um, like some other methods. And you know, there, there may be a time and a place where, where we need permanent changes. But if we don't, um, RNA is a great, uh, great tool. It gets in, it gets out. And uh, I think there's, that's a real ethical advantage. I'll just add, you know, when I first heard Drew's, it, the, the antibody responses, so that's B cells that are making antibodies, were so spectacular. When, when my colleagues uh, said that, I told you, yeah, he's, Drew's going to save the world, my, my question was, are we going to start seeing B cell tumors, lymphomas? Now, I, I don't think so. But if you ask me what I worry about, stuff like that. But it, that will take years and years to show up. But it, it's just a strong, such a strong B cell. And, you know, the side effects of the vaccine themselves are, are substantial. It's, it, you know, for COVID, everyone's willing to put up with a little bit of pain or moderate amount. For uh, other vaccines, it may be less, less so. And there's a balance. If the lipid nanoparticle you've heard about is not as that's where the side effects mostly come from if that's not as potent or immune uh, it's less immunogenic so if it's not as toxic it's also not as immunogenic so it, it's a delicate balance trying to balance the side effects and the immunogenicity that the lipid nanoparticle uh, provides with um, with uh, e efficacy so in a, in a sense, the LNP is the adjuvant in, in those uh, vaccines. And th there's enormous amount of work right now in different types of lipid nanoparticles, different uh, formulations. And I suppose some could have side effects we're not aware of. And uh, lots and lots of effort on how to target them to specific cell types, as I mentioned, using antibodies in the surface is one approach, but there are others as well. And so I could imagine that mistargeting would be another problem. If you're hoping to get it all to one cell type, but it's not 100%, and you're getting expression of what you sent there in the wrong cell type, would that cause a side effect? Or would you generate an immune response to what you're expressing, you know, that's untoward? So every new platform is, has unexpected side effects that may arise. But it's probably a lot more safe and benign than other gene therapy approaches where we're manipulating DNA. So I think that's what Kristen was, was getting at. Uh, I'll just add one quick point, that with COVID, you have one mRNA that you're putting into this lipid carrier. With my vaccine, I pointed out there's three. Now, that means we have one-third the amount of each of the mRNAs 
if we don't want to exceed a toxicity level. So with this delivery mechanism, there's a limit to how much mRNA you can squeeze in. More mRNA is likely to give you a better response. More mRNA means more lipid nanoparticle. They're tied at the hip. And if you increase one, you increase the other, more toxicity. So there may be some limitations we'll see there as well. How much can you squeeze in for vaccines that need only one immunogen? You're, in, you're fine. If it needs more, like ours, I think will um, maybe may be more difficult. One more. I have one question about the, the uh, actually the. This has been a fantastic review, by the way. Thank you all. Uh, one thing I was, from a global perspective, I was wondering where is any, is there any strategy to look at things that would have a more of a global sustainable impact, like in less resource countries, like with HIV and Ebola? Because I think COVID's been dramatic, but throughout the world, globally, I think we can't forget what's happening in Africa. Ebola is going to come back as a major threat, and HIV is rampant in other places where drugs are just not affordable. I was wondering, are there any strategies for that global perspective? Do you want to come up? Uh, yeah, nice question. Um, yeah, I spent uh, quite a few years uh, running a program in Botswana, Africa for, for Penn. Uh, Hence why I asked him to come. <laughs> Um, and and the um, you know I I think it's really important that question now HIV everyone wants a vaccine and mRNA people are all over this you know try to and it's a tricky virus it keeps changing and it does so faster and more effectively than COVID so it's a very tough target Ebola probably easier but um, the, the 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 important thing I think is that. As we develop the technologies in the resource-rich countries, we have to make sure they can reach the resource poor. Otherwise, uh, we failed. And Penn, as an institution, has its heart in the right place. Hopefully, we can do that. Yeah. I think uh, you may hear more in the upcoming weeks about some efforts that uh, we I probably can't talk about right now, but are underway in uh, some of our cancer therapies to try to spread some of the um, what seems like high technology uh, approaches, but you know, as they become more accepted, more adopted, the manufacturing of things gets cheaper, yep. and we are able to spread them uh, internationally. I completely agree with that. So uh, right now, mRNA vaccines are not cheaper than uh, other vaccine types, but I think the exact same thing will happen that happened to the um, DNA sequencing, for example, that. Uh, uh, it was very, very expensive. The Human Genome Project was really expensive, and now it's much, much, much cheaper. So that's what I envision, that in the next five to ten years, maybe less than that, uh, we can make RNA vaccines much cheaper, and then we don't need to worry, worry about uh, this issue that uh, countries, um, some countries in Africa, or many countries, actually, I should say, uh, cannot get access to these vaccines. And, um, you know, if we are smart and we can f uh, figure out very good vaccine designs, we can uh, develop these uh, broadly protective vaccines. So just to give you a, uh, an example, um, we just started a research project uh, with uh, some uh, teams in Europe uh, and we want to develop a pan uh, a phylovirus uh, vaccine. So the, it would protect not only against Ebola but Marburg and other hemorrhagic fever viruses as well and then you know, we could use it something like, like a combined vaccine like MMR or, or, or something similar. And though time doesn't permit us to, uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to have to stop, but time doesn't permit us to um, uh, tell you all about it. Norbert just published a paper about lyophilizing these vaccines so they can be shipped without cold storage uh, as well. So we're, we're working on these things. Um, I'll just close. I'm sorry we can't take all the other questions. You're welcome to come up and ask our speakers individually. I'll just close by saying, uh, if I were you, I would be very proud of what Penn Medicine is doing. Uh, it's it's uh, been a wonderful place to be part of the scientific environment here, and it's only getting better and better. So thank you all for being here this weekend, and uh, thanks to our speakers.